That was for Brother Marvin. Amen, good. Yep. And they did good again. That was like no practice, too. So thank you for that, choir. Um, I talked to Brother Marvin on the phone. I already said that. But maybe he was able to tune in and see the kiddos. He misses our kids. So I, I figured that would be a good way Amen. to see the kiddos. So, Amen. Well, let's go to the book of Acts and chapter number 2. And we'll try to make some sense of what I've got here. Today, and um, pray that the Lord will use it uh, in our life. That is why we're here to hear from God, <laughs> uh, to hear someone take the Word of God and explain some things about the Word of God. God's Word changes lives. The Spirit of God um, works through the Word of God to change the child of God into a likeness of the Son of God. Amen. Right? That's how it works. So, Acts chapter number 2. If you're there, just say amen and look at me. Amen. All right. Let's start reading in verse number 1 of Acts chapter number 2. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. And it filled all the house where they were sitting. So there's a sound of a mighty wind. And it filled the house. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire. And it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. And begin to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men out of every nation under heaven. Now when this was noised abroad, that is this miracle, this wonder that these people were up in this room speaking in all these languages... When this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded because that every man heard them speak in his own language. And they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? Uh, that was kind of like saying, <laughs> Are not all these who speak from Texas? Or something like that. You didn't like that, but okay. <laughs> Verse number 8. And by the way, I lived in Texas. So I'm not hating on Texas. I just, I just figured I'd see if you were paying attention. Now, um, verse number 8. How hear we every man in our own tongue, wherein we were born? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, and the dwellers of Mesopotamia, and in Judea, and Cappadocia, and Pontus, and Asia, Phrygia... Pamphylia, 
in Egypt and in the parts of Libya about Cyrene, and the strangers of Rome, Jews and proselytes, Cretes and Arabians, we do hear them, these people in the upper room, speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God. And they were all amazed and were in doubt, saying one to another, and if everyone would with me out loud, what are the last three words of verse number 12? What meaneth this? So this stuff was going on, and these people heard this happening, and they had this little congregation happening. It was a big congregation, actually. And they were saying one to another, What meaneth this? Verse 13, others mocking said, these men are full of new wine. They're drunk. They're drunk. That's what's going on. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judea, and all ye that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you, and hearken to my words. For these are not drunken, as ye suppose, seeing as but the third hour of the day. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And he's quoting Joel right here. It shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. And your young men shall see visions. And your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and on my handmaidens, I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in heaven above, and signs in the earth beneath blood and fire and vapor of smoke, the sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before that great and notable day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord, what are the last three words, shall be saved. So there's a lot going on here. And um, to really dissect this whole portion would take way too long. But I got a message I'd like to present to you today. And uh, I hope it will be a blessing. So if you'll bow with me, we'll pray one more time. So Lord, we are going to get into your word here. And I pray that you would help me to rightly divide it, to make it clear. And uh, to help us to be intentional on hearing what is said today. And uh, Lord, there's, there's just not a lot of time left, I don't think, in this life. And I don't, I don't mean that maybe we're all just going to pass away by old age. I mean, I don't, I don't think there's a lot of time left. I think you're coming back pretty soon. I think that. And uh, Lord, if there's somebody here that's not prepared to meet you, they need to make that decision today to trust in Christ, to call upon the name of the Lord and be saved. So God, you, I'm asking you, please, by your spirit to do the work you have planned today to do and that you'd get me out of the way and that you would you would help us today in Jesus precious name amen, amen. You may be seated so I, I noticed this morning verse number 12 as I was reading back through this so this stuff's going on on the day of Pentecost like I said there I could we could just we could say a lot about Pentecost and the, the Holy Spirit descending and speaking in tongues. And I did that a few weeks ago, though. Uh, we're not going to really dissect that too much. But there's a lot going on on this day. And there's a big crowd that has amassed here. And they were all amazed, were in doubt. And when that caught my attention this morning when it said, they asked, what meaneth this? What meaneth this? And that question kind of sets the direction for the message today. Because when they heard the disciples and these people speaking in different languages that, that just happened to be the languages of the men who were gathered there for Pentecost, just a coincidence, right? They asked that question in a very serious way. What is going on here? You've got multiple languages, which are real languages, Spanish, English, uh, Portuguese, uh, German, those are languages, okay? They have their own uh, forms to them and everything. So you got multiple languages being spoken by some uneducated people. That was not, that was a derogatory statement when they said, are not all these which speak Galileans? That was not like saying, I bet you these guys have a degree in language. That's not what they were saying. It was a, it was down, it was, it was a, it was, they were dissing them. 
right? It was a derogatory statement. So you get all these multiple languages being spoken by these uneducated Galileans that had been following this miracle worker from Galilee who had just been crucified 50 days ago. Because that's what Pentecost is. It's 50 days from Passover, and Jesus was crucified on Passover. So here you have this going on 50 days later, and it's just in time. These languages are being spoken just in time for these thousands of Jews uh, to have assembled here in Jerusalem for the festival. And some of these people had the insight to realize something very special is going on here. Right? Um, some didn't. Some said these people are drunk. But some people have the discernment to say something is going on here. There's something special happening. What does all this mean? And when you have circumstances or an event like that that's taking place and a question like that, I'm just trying to think about these people are real human beings and this is a real amazing situation that's going on. And when you have a question like that, you can believe that there was a response that had to be given to that question once they learned to answer to it. In other words, they said, what is going on here? And they're about to find out what's going on here. And after they find out what's going on, there has got to be some sort of response to the solution, to the answer to the question. They can't just leave it alone. Whatever's going on that day had to do with them. It was not by accident. It was not a coincidence. And some of them, I believe, have the discernment to see this is not by chance. Something important is happening, and I want to know what is going on. And once they learn what's going on, we see them respond in a right way. You just can't ignore. There, there has to be an, an answer to this. It's a personal situation here. And I just, I, I just, surely we know this, but there are some things that you just cannot ignore. You can, you can try to ignore them. But eventually, it's going to call for a decision to be made. Amen. And one of those that we have to decide to make is what are we going to do with Jesus Christ, all right? Amen. So when you, get, when you die, the, the most important question that you can answer is, what did you do with Jesus Christ? Amen. I mean, that is a decision you have got to come to grips with. And like we talked, I talked about a guy last Wednesday that we talked to door knocking the other day. It isn't something that you can say, well, I just, I decide not to decide. Well, then you have made your decision to reject the Son of God, and you have made your choice. It isn't something you say, I'm just, I don't want to fall on either side. You have just fallen on a side, and it is the wrong side. Right? So I'm saying there's some things you just cannot ignore. And when we learn about these things, there is a decision that we have to make about whatever it is we just learned about. And that is what's happening on the day of Pentecost 2,000 years ago. Something here had begun to take place that could not be ignored. Yeah. This could not be swept under the rug. This could not just be, you can't approach what's happening here and find out what's going on and then walk away with indifference. Amen. It, it, it just it doesn't work that way. You can't walk away with this indifferent attitude. Well, oh well, just take it or leave it. <laughs> Not with something like this. It doesn't happen that way. Because what's, what was starting, beginning to take place on that day was like, I was going to talk about this in Sunday school, but this was the part of the unfolding plan and purpose of God. That's what was happening. This was a really, really big deal. Not just to them. It's a big deal to me and you. And you and I, or however you want to say that. We tried to figure that out for the wedding the other night, and I think you got it right. Her mother and I. I don't know good grammar, but I'm telling you, this doesn't just have to do with them. This has to do with you, and this has to do with me, right? And this, what this was, was the beginning of an unfolding of the plan and purpose of God. And I'm just kind of, I got a piece of paper. I was going to show you this earlier, I think. I don't remember now what I was going to do. But if, if this is the purpose of God, God, God has a plan. You with me? This is the plan. It's a blank piece of paper. I know that's an illustration. Pay attention. This is God's plan. It's full. It's complete. He knows everything about it. But he gives it to us in pieces. Okay? Bits and pieces. And it unfolds. Bits and pieces. You with me? It's called progressive revelation. And it also unfolds progressively. One of these days it's going to be like this. But it doesn't just start that way. It starts here. And it goes like this. Oh. 
Oh. Oh. You with me? That's the plan of God. And what's happening here 2,000 years ago on the day of Pentecost was one of these right here. And we may just be about right there right now. But it was an unfolding of God's plan and purpose that started before the foundation of the world. Okay, when it comes to God, God's not making it up as He goes like me and you <laughs> do when we're trying to fix a water heater door. We just kind of try to make it up as we go. We want it to be good when we're done. God knows from the very beginning what's going to happen in the very end. Okay, so it's not like God's just saying, well, this kind of, this kind of seems good, or they did that, now i got to... No, God knows what's happening. And right here was an unfolding of what was happening in the mind of God. It's a very special thing here. And what, what's interesting is, what is happening on that day, 2,000 years ago, wasn't the beginning of... Okay, let me start that over. What was happening that day was something connected... To something very old. That's what I'm trying to say. What was happening on that day was connected to something very, very old. And yet is also connected to something yet future. Okay, so what's unfolding here. And these people were witnessing. And these people speaking in other languages. The Holy Ghost of God had just indwelt the church. And, and the body of Christ. And now they're speaking in these other languages. And what is going on here? Well, Peter's going to tell them that what is happening is connected to something that was very old. And also what we can look at, we can look back and say, it's still connected to something yet future. So that's why it's important to us, right? Because not all of what God has prophesied has been completely fulfilled. Okay? You read your Bible, there's a lot of stuff that has happened, but not everything that has been prophesied has been uh, fulfilled. So what does that leave us with? That leaves us with expectation. Okay? The fact that not everything has been fulfilled leaves us with anticipation. Amen. We can expect something to still happen. We can anticipate that something's still going to happen. And it leaves us, just like these people were on that day, in the valley of decision. There is a decision we have to make. There was a decision that they had to make. Yeah. What meaneth this? Well... Peter had the discernment that day to recognize what was taking place on that day was an unfolding of the prophecy that Joel had made about 900 years before Peter was born. So here's what's happening in the, in the upper room and the Holy Spirit comes down and they're speaking in tongues and this is happening and Peter's watching this, no doubt thinking this through in his mind. The Holy Spirit of God is helping him understand these things. And when all this was happening, Peter discerned pretty quickly, I know what's going on here. I know exactly what's going on here. This is what Joel talked about 900 years ago. Like I said, what's happening here is connected to something a long time ago. And Peter says, I get it. I got it. So if you'll do me a favor and turn back to the book of Joel really quick. The book of Joel, Daniel, Hosea. Joel, Amos, Obadiah, 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 Jonah, Micah, Nahum. Just trying to tell you where Joel is. If you go to Hosea, you went too far. Go to Daniel, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel. Joel's not one of them books you <laughs> preach out of a lot, I guess, and, and read a lot. But Joel, when you get there, find chapter number two of the book of Joel. Joel chapter 2. I want you to read with me or follow with me verse 28 of Joel chapter 2. It shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. And also upon the servants... And upon the handmaids in those days will I pour out my spirit. And I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before that great, before the great 
and the terrible day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance, as the Lord hath said, and in the remnant whom the Lord shall call. So that's almost word for word. Almost word for word. And I just want to talk about Joel for just a minute. And I know this is a little different than normal, but try to follow with me, okay? Because what was happening 2,000 years ago was connected to something 900 years before it. And what we are doing today is connected with something that happened 2,000 years ago. This is, we, we don't live in a vacuum, right? It says this all has to do with us today because you are sitting here and you are alive and you are a soul and you will live forever somewhere. Who was Joel? Joel was a prophet to Judah. Judah was the southern kingdom. And he was a prophet. I didn't realize this until a couple days ago. Maybe I'm a bad Bible student. But Joel was a prophet during the days of Elisha. Elisha was a long time ago. He was right after Elijah, right? And you know Elijah's ministry was amazing. But anyway, so he was a prophet in Judah, the days of Elisha, um, which was... This is so amazing. When Joel prophesied, it was right at the very beginning of written prophecy. Right at the very beginning of written prophecy. And God sent Joel to bring attention to the sins of the people and call them to repentance. Okay? The prophet comes and he preaches the message that God has him to preach about sin and repentance. And in Joel chapter 1, you don't have to look there, but his, the prophecy begins by talking about the destruction that the insects and the drought and the blasting heat had caused in their nation. He says in verse 4, That which the palmer worm hath left, the eat, the, hath the locust eaten. That which the locust hath left, hath the canker worm eaten. And that which the canker worm hath left, the caterpillar hath eaten. It's just a succession of things that are happening in their nation. And what God is trying to do with them is to draw a line in between the two things. This is what's happening in your nation, and these are your sins, and they are connected. Okay? This is happening to you because you are not living right. Amen. You with me? That's what he sent the prophet to come and tell them. You're not doing right. You're rejecting the Lord. You're not in love with God like you vowed to follow him. And this stuff is happening in your life because you are in rebellion against God. You have begun to apostatize against the Lord. And I don't know if we can always equate crop destruction and drought and those kind of things with the judgment of God. But in their case, that is exactly what was happening. He sent the locusts and these insects to level their crops and he didn't send the rain, and then he had the heat blast them, and we're talking about a lot of problem. And God was bringing correction and judgment upon them for breaking their vows that he had made to them a long time ago. And as you know, loss of crops, especially on this scale, especially 2,900 years ago, okay, in this kind of a small nation, the loss of crops, the lack of rain, that affects everybody in multiple ways. It destroys the economy. It, it puts people out of jobs, right? It does that now. But think a long time ago in that small area how that would have affected their whole nation. Uh, it kills cattle. It depletes uh, the stock that they had. It depletes all of that. And it creates all sorts of depression and emotional instability, unsettled hearts. And when things like this escalate... There are marital problems, parental problems. There's all sorts of problems. You've got to try to wrap your mind around this. That when Joel came to Judah, it wasn't that just the crops were doing bad. They were in a really bad place. And it, would, it affected their economy and their attitudes and their families and their marriages and their parenting. Everything, it trickles down, okay? I mean, they were not doing well at all. And the mind-boggling aspect to this is their lack of discernment to recognize what is going on here. Why is all this happening? So God sends Joel to tell them your sin is connected with what's happening. Right? 
It's because you have turned against God is why it's happening. And we don't have time, but we could sit here for just a while and talk about our own nation, couldn't we? About why things are happening the way they are in our nation after we have killed so many babies in the womb and after we have turned... Are you with me this morning, okay? After we have turned against God and we wonder, what is happening? I think somebody preached about that last Sunday about the influence of the devil in our culture. What's happening? You have turned against God, that's what's happening. What's happening to my kids? What's happening in my marriage? And we could go on down the line. Are you right with God? Amen. Are you? Yes or no? If it is a no, then connect the dots. Amen. And so Joel is trying to get them to connect the dots. And these people seemed almost oblivious to the problems in their life. Yeah. We don't know where the... But thankfully, God shows mercy on stupid people. Amen. Like me. Thank God for that. I was, too, I was too blind, and I was too lost, and I was too ignorant, and I was too selfish and prideful to even see what was going on in my... I knew my life was a wreck, too, before I got saved. But I couldn't see it, but thank God the Holy Spirit of God came and said, You need to be saved. That is your problem, little boy. And I said, yes, sir, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord, right? Okay, then. Uh, a man named Albert Barnes said, The judgments of God are linked together by an invisible chain, each drawing on the other. Yet at each link of the lengthening chain, allowing space and time for repentance to break it through. I want to thank God that he gives us a little bit of space to repent. Okay? Okay. So, these people needed to take this to heart. And they needed to cry out to God in genuine sorrow for their sins. Amen. And in chapter number 2, God reveals through the prophet Joel that if they would break off their sins and turn to them with their whole heart, that he would revitalize their nation. I'd, I would call your attention, since you're there, verse number... Oh... Verse 25. I will restore to you the years that the locust hath eaten. The canker worm and the caterpillar and the palmer worm, my great army which I sent among you, and ye shall eat in plenty and be satisfied and praise the name of the Lord your God that hath dealt wondrously with you, and my people shall never be ashamed. I'm just saying, God said, if you will just get right with me, I will change your life. I will change your nation for the better. I will restore to life that which was dead. That is awesome. How does this connect with what Peter's dealing with? It, is, it connects perfectly. The Jews had just crucified the Lord Jesus Christ, their Messiah. They completely said, we don't want you. We don't want God's way. They rejected the Son of God, people. That connects perfectly. So what did they need to do? Repent. Believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. They may have been 900 years separated. Please stick with me here. But I'm telling you, the problem is always the same. It is a sin problem. Amen. They turned against the Lord. God said, if you'll turn to me, I will restore to you from death to life. I'm telling you, God can do that. Where there's been death, he can bring back to life. And we could spend all day talking about Joel. I, I love the prophets. You go get in the prophets, man. You got some preaching material there, buddy. If you can't preach out of the prophets, I've got, I question your call. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? There's some good stuff in here. And it applies to right where we are, but we're not going to spend all day doing that. I just want to bring your attention to what Joel said. And, and, you know, Peter quoted Joel. Please look at verse number 31. I want to draw your attention to something. He says, The sun shall be turned into darkness, and the moon into blood, before the great and the terrible, what are those last words? Day of the Lord come. Now, the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord is mentioned five times in the book of Joel alone. That's a lot. For a book that's only like this many pages in my Bible, for God to say something about the day, anything, five times, 
That's a big deal. If you know how Bible study works, when God repeats himself, you had better pay attention. And he mentions the day of the Lord five times in this little bitty prophecy of Joel here. Now we need to understand, which you probably already do, that the day of the Lord is not a single day. Like your birthday, like your marriage day, like your anniversary, right? It is not a single day. Of course, you only have one natural birthday, right? It is a single day. But the day of the Lord is a reference to any time the Lord brings judgment on mankind. If God brings judgment on mankind, it is the day of the Lord. Jehovah God, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. That is God the Father. That is Jehovah. That is the I Am. The day of the Lord has come. What does that mean? That means judgment is on you. That's what that means. You know that that kind of judgment that is really unpleasant? You ever had some of that judgment from your dad? The day of dad. (laughs) The day of my father has arrived, right? No, no, really. It is really unpleasant, but it is very deserved by sinners. Please don't lose me. This all has to do with where I'm going, okay? Because it is deserved. Sinners deserve judgment. The day of the Lord does not come unprovoked. Sinners deserve it. You and I deserve it, right? Thank God for the blood of of Jesus Christ that covers us and makes us righteous before God because without it, we would deserve what we get, which is hell and the lake of fire for eternity. Okay? We deserve that. There was one man I read after he said this, every particular judgment that takes place in the history of God's kingdom is the day of the Lord. Listen to this part. And yet only approaching as far as the complete fulfillment was concerned. In other words, each time the Lord, look, I'm talking about Joel's prophecy here. Joel is telling them, you got the locusts, you got the canker worm, you got all these insects that are killing your crops, eating them down. You got all these issues, no rain, blasting heat. You know what that is? That is God's judgment on you. It is the day of the Lord is at hand, he says here. It's right here, right now. It is, it is on top of you. And every time the day of the Lord takes place in the scripture, in these small aspects, it is a glimpse into the final judgment on earth. It is just a little window into God's final judgment. Can I tell you something here right now? God's final judgment hasn't happened yet. And let me tell you something. You do not want to be there when it happens. What, these, what the nation of Judah was experience, experiencing back there in Joel's day, that was, that was the day they were under the judgment of God for their sins. But it wasn't the final judgment. See, if, I could have, if we would have talked about in Sunday school what I had planned, we'd have talked about the progressive revelation of God and how he says something way back here and right about here, part of it gets fulfilled, but not all of it. Because the rest of it's going to get fulfilled over here somewhere. You with me? He gives it. Some of it happens. But not all of it happens. It's amazing. It's amazing how God's mind is eternal. What is the final judgment? Well, unless I'm like totally misinterpreting my Bible. The final judgment is the tribulation and Armageddon. And I know we've had some bad wars, but let me tell you something. You ain't never seen anything like the tribulation period. The great tribulation and Armageddon. You ain't seen that. The final judgment is the tribulation. And it ends with Armageddon and the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ in glory. He's not coming as a lamb again. He's coming as a conquering warrior. The lion of the tribe of Judah, man. That's my Lord. He's coming back as a lion. Amen. And it's interesting, it is interesting that Joel spoke about Armageddon in chapter number 3. He talks about Armageddon. I don't, man, I wish I had time to read it. Uh, Maybe just a little bit, maybe just a little bit. Verse 9, proclaim ye this among the Gentiles, prepare war, 
Make up the mighty men. Let all the men of war draw near. Let them come up. Beat your plowshares into swords and your pruning hits into spears, pruning hooks into spears. Let the weak say, I am strong. Assemble yourselves and come, all ye heathen. Gather yourselves together round about. Thither cause thy mighty ones to come down, O Lord. Let the heathen be awakened. Come up to the valley of Jehoshaphat, where there will I sit to judge the heathen. I don't have time to this. I'm telling you, it is amazing that Joel, verse 14, multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision, for the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. And he is talking about Armageddon 2,900 years ago. At the very beginning of written prophecy, Joel is talking about something that's going to happen at the very end of written prophecy. The mind of God. God knows all things. We do understand that. And reading the word of God about tomorrow is like reading the headlines of today. He's been perfectly accurate in all the prophecies in the scripture. And, and the fact that God has been so accurate, the fact, you know, listen, the fact that God has been so accurate in all of his predictions ought to really make us think about the ones that haven't happened yet. Yeah. If he's been right every single time, maybe I should really take note of what's going to happen. We can't wrap our minds around God's omniscience. But it's an attribute that only God possesses. But nevertheless, it's true. So he gives us what we need to know, when we need to know it. And there are certain things he's make, made known to us so that we will be prepared for it to come. There will be a great... And terrible day of the Lord. That's what Joel said. And other prophets. And that's what Peter quoted. And here's the deal. Joel's listeners. They could repent. And they could get it. They could be alleviated. Of the judgment. God said if you will just turn to me with your whole heart. I can fix all this for you. I can make it better. I can heal you. I can heal your land. I have the power to do that if you'll just get right with me. But I'm telling you, in the day of in the final judgment, you're not going to escape that. Yeah. Would you flip over to Revelation for me real quick? Revelation chapter 6. Revelation 6. I, I just people, you know, we look at the folks in Judah and we're thinking, why can't you see? That your immoral lifestyle and your, your rebellion against God is causing all of the problems in your nation. Why can't you see that? Can you not see that the judgment of God is upon you? But I want to ask some people nowadays, when they look around in this world that we're in and in their own life, I have to say, can you not see this is happening? I don't know. Revelation chapter 6, please. Verse number 12. And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal. And lo, there was a great earthquake. And the sun became black as sackcloth of hair. Well, that sounds very reminiscent of what Joel said. The sun became black as sackcloth of hair. And the moon became as, oh, hey, look, this says the same thing Joel said. And the stars of heaven fell unto the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs, when she is shaken of a mighty wind. Now, I don't know, there's different opinions on that, but when it says the stars of heaven fell, it sounds like a bunch of asteroids falling to earth to me. Some people think that's the angels or the demons falling. I'm thinking you're, you're going to be in a world of hurt when this happens, okay? Look here at verse 14. And the heaven departed as a scroll when it's rolled together. And every mountain and every island were moved out of their places. We're talking about some catastrophic stuff. And the kings of the earth and the great men and the rich men and the chief captains and the mighty men 
and every bondman and every freeman hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb, for the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? Listen to me. You are not going to make it through that good. And it's coming. It may have the secular name World War III. It is coming. And it is that close. And if you can't see that, I feel for you. I don't like watching the news either. Sometimes we have to, and there's some decent stuff. <laughs> anyway, all you've got to do is look at a few different things and say, what mean is this? Yeah. What's going on there? Are you with me? Peter said, I'll tell you what it means. <laughs> what mean is this? I'll tell you what it means. It means the last days are here. That's what Peter said, uh, Acts. He's the one that said that, not Joel. All right? He, I know Joel said, and afterwards, Peter had the discernment to say, these are the last days. In verse number 14, 15, 16, 17, it shall come to pass in the last days. Now, I don't know about you. I don't know a lot of English very good, and I'm not really good at King James English sometimes. But when somebody said it's the last days, that means it's like the last part of something. It's the last epoch of time. It is the last part. It is the last portion. It's the last eon. I mean, we are at the doors, friend. Yeah. Peter saw that. He said, I'll tell you what's happening. It is the last days, and God's beginning to wrap up his plans. What you see here, Peter says, just in a really short summary, that's a sign that the end is near. Judgment is coming on sinners. Peter says, in the last days I'll pour out my spirit. And I get that is what's happening here. We're not going to deal with that right now. But then he says in verse 20 about what we just read in Revelation. And Joel, sun should be turned to darkness, moon to blood, before that great and notable day of the Lord come. Peter understands there's something about to happen very big. And you want to be on the right side of things. So... Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Just call on Jesus in faith and he will save you from that. Amen. Yep. I can tell you with great assurance today that if it was looking like it was about to wrap up in Peter's day, we are at the door. Yeah. The Jews are returning to Israel like never before. And if you know a little bit about your Bible, that's prophecy. Coming to pass right in front of us. And so many professed Christians don't care a lick. They don't see it. They don't study their Bible. they just like, whatever, oh, that's cool, whatever. There's a lot of Christians that don't even stand with Israel because they have a mistaken understanding of theology and a mistaken understanding of the church. And they say, well, God's done with Israel. We hate the Jews. I'm sorry, but that's not what the Bible teaches, friends. And we see them coming back. That's amazing. The global, e the global economy, the, the governments of the world coming together and these treaties about the pandemic and the treaties about this and the Abraham Accords and all of this stuff is happening right in front of us. Don't you realize the Antichrist is going to be a global... Uh, leader, and it's all going that direction. Just give me a chip in my hand, and I'll just go to the gas pump and go beep beep. I got a credit card. I got three credit cards that you can go beep beep. You don't even have to insert it anymore. You just walk by and go beep, and it checks you out. Yeah. What's the next step, Brian? A chip there or a chip there? So when you walk out of Walmart, it just goes beep beep. You don't have to take your wallet out anymore, dude. About 100 years, 50 years ago, we'd have thought, that is nuts. 
It is happening right now. So how is the Antichrist going to get people to take the mark of the beast? It's not going to be hard. They're going to be starving. You want food, you better take that mark. Okay, just give me the vaccine. I mean, yeah, I'll take the mark. I put that in there, didn't I? You see how I did that? Some of y'all didn't even catch that. I didn't, I just... If you don't see... And we're that close. How about Russia and China and Iran? You think this is just because they're bored, they're buddying up? No, it's called prophecy. God saw it. He put it in there so we could have our eyes open with it. And it's happening right in front of you. Xi Jinping and this Putin dude and all these people. Yeah, let's get together and we'll just jump all over Israel because we hate Israel. Everybody has hated Israel forever because they're God's people. So, okay. There's at least two responses. I got to hurry. But there's at least two responses to something like this. And somebody would either say, it's been 2,000 years. Or if you want to go with Joel's prophecy, 2,900 years. And you can't honestly believe something's still going to take place. You weird people coming to church, letting that guy scream and yell at you. You better get right with God. You bunch of weird old foolish people. That's, that's, one, that's one look at this. You can't honestly expect something to take place. The other one is this. It's been 2,000 years and you can't honestly believe something isn't about to take place. That's where I'm at. Number two. Because according to Peter... In 2 Peter, the only reason I am standing here today and preaching the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, that he died for your sins, and if you will look to him, call upon the name of the Lord, you can be saved from the wrath of God. The only reason I'm here doing that is because the Lord is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. It's the grace of God that you even have a preacher and the word of God to tell you to get right. So when you go to hell, don't look at God and say, nobody told me. I'm standing here today that you can be saved from your sins if you will just look to Jesus. Amen. Don't blame God. He's not willing that you should die and go to hell. He died on the cross for you. God's timetable and our timetables are two very different things. A day with the Lord is of a thousand years. And a thousand years is of a day. You know what that means? He, doesn't, he does not pay attention to time like we do. So what he said 3,000 years ago, that was just a couple of days, dude. Yeah. What is eternity to what is eternity? I don't know. I know I can't figure it out, but God is eternal. And to him, a few thousand years, that's a drop in the big, huge, ever-ending bucket. Yeah. Well, I, I will just cut to the chase here and close up. Is there not? I don't want to be like, I did get a little bit of a late start, though. So just give me just a few more minutes. It's like, have you ever heard of a, what is it called? When a woman uh, wants to get married and have babies, she has that internal clock thing. What's that called? Internal, okay, I'll take that. Y'all are looking at me like a calf at a new gate. Like, what is he talking about? You never heard about stuff like that? A woman, I got plenty of women. Why aren't y'all saying, yeah, I get that. I want to Right? You know, you got that something in there that you're a lady and you're about to get to that point where I need to get married. I need to have some kids. That's what I want to do with my life. There's that internal clock thing that's ticking in there, right? I think that's in all of us. It provokes us to do certain things while we have time to do it. You ever heard of a bucket list? How many of y'all have a bucket list? Whoa. Tammy, what's one thing on your bucket list? <laughs> I'll choose Alexis first. She's a what is the one thing on your bucket list? 
Amen. There you go. She just proved my point. You want to get married. There's something in you as a young lady that just wants to get married and have a family, right? Right? I do, I do. <laughs> marriage. Tammy, what's one thing? You're ready. Amen. That's cool. That's, it's happening. It's happening. If the Lord doesn't come back, it's going to happen. That's a good. But there's something in you, you're like, I want this to happen before I go. Anybody else have things like that? What's, no. You want to get that fair lane going before it goes? You want a parachute? Let's pray for mail, everybody. <laughs> I'm just, surely there's something in you that says, man, we don't have a lot of time here. And I, I want to get this done before I'm, and I want to, I, I guess I'll just close. There's, there's an article I read yesterday uh, that made me think about the completion of the last days. Anybody ever heard of the doomsday clock? Okay. Can I read you an article? Can you try to just listen. I know it's real easy to tune out when I read something. But listen to this. This is an article about the doomsday clock. It was founded in 1945 by Albert Einstein and University of Chicago scientists who helped, who helped develop the first atomic weapons in the Manhattan Project. Stop right there. I'm sorry. But I have to say, when you're working on atomic weapons, you know the end's coming. And the one that went off in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, that's nothing compared to what they have. Yeah. Are you under, do you understand that? We're talking about mass, weapons of mass destruction that would wipe this planet out. Yeah. So these guys, these people came up with this uh, doomsday clock a couple years after that. And they used the imagery of the apocalypse, which is midnight. Midnight is the apocalypse. Hey, that's interesting. My Bible says another word for the book of Revelation is John's apocalypse. Okay, all right. Countdown to zero. That conveys the threat to humanity and the planet. I love this stuff. The doomsday clock is set every year by the Bulletin's Science and Security Board in consultation with the board of sponsors. The clock has become a universally recognized indicator of the world's vulnerability to catastrophe from nuclear weapons, climate change, <laughs> and disruptive technologies in their domains. In March 2022, which was a couple months ago, the Science and Security Board released a new statement in the wake of Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Here's the statement they made. In January 2022, the Science and Security Board, they set the doomsday clock. Does anybody know where it's set right now? No. How many did you say, 10? No, nope. more? I thought so too, but it is more than that. It's at 100 seconds. You think about a clock, though, 100 seconds ain't that long. Okay, it's set at 100 seconds to midnight. At that time, we, these people say, we called out Ukraine as a potential flashpoint in the increasingly tense international security landscape. For many years, we and others have warned that the most likely way nuclear weapons might be used is through an unwanted or unintended escalation from a conventional conflict. In other words, you start bowing up too much, we're going to start pushing buttons. Russia's invasion of Ukraine has brought this nightmare scenario to life, with Russian President Vladimir Putin threatening to elevate nuclear alert levels and even first use of nuclear weapons if NATO steps in to help Ukraine. This is what 100 seconds to midnight looks like. Now that's interesting. Because according to this secular idea, we're not only in the last days, we're in the last seconds. Yeah. Somebody says, well, that's, that is secular. You're not, you're not following me. Because that says something about our anxiousness. That says something about our intuition that knows something is about to give, folks. Amen. And while unbelievers that have no idea who Jesus is, they don't know the scripture, they're not enlightened by God, even they understand something big is about to happen. Yeah. We know what it is. Amen. He's coming. 
Are you ready? Yeah. I don't think everybody is. What meaneth this? What a question. What is going on here, they asked. God's given us all we need to know in the book. He's done everything he's going to do to save you. It's up to you to make the decision. And it's interesting within that group of people, some of them were, were honestly, genuinely interested. What is going on here? Yeah. Did you hear some of the other ones in church? This guy's full of new wine. This guy's nutty. <laughs> you see what I mean? Some people are genuinely interested. Other people couldn't care less. It's not going to stop it. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. It's time to decide. It's time to decide. Dear Lord, we're thankful that you have done what you're going to do. And... um, just pray that we'd all be ready for it. So, Lord, would you bless our time today, the rest of our time, and uh, help us to be very honest with ourselves and ask, are we truly ready for what's coming? Are we on the right side of things? As far as I understand it, Lord, you're going to take your people out before the day of the Lord comes. Your word says we are not appointed unto wrath. We are born again, your children. But there are some that sit in church that are not ready. They say, well, I've, I've prayed. You said, call upon the name of the Lord. Yes, Lord, but help them to understand it's about their faith. What do they believe? Have they turned to Christ under conviction of sin for forgiveness? Have they trusted in Jesus and what he did on the cross for them? Not their self, not their works, not their plans, but have they come to that place in their life where they trust, they know in whom they have believed and are persuaded that what Jesus Christ did on the cross was for them personally. And they've received that and embraced that because I fear that there are some have not. And when the day of the Lord comes, they're going to be very... It's going to be over for them. So would you speak to their heart, Lord, today, by your Spirit, and draw them to Jesus. For we know that Christ said, He that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. And when we call upon the name of the Lord in faith, you will save us. So, Lord, this morning, would you deal with our hearts in a very real way? Help us not to leave this place not right with you. Help us to recommit ourselves to you if that need be. So, Lord, use the invitation. Help us to make that decision. We cannot ignore this. This is something we can't just ignore. So help us to make that right choice. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, if you